Hi, I'm Dr. George Triadafilopoulos. I'm a gastroenterologist, and I was asked to give a presentation on mixed esophageal disease, or MED, and providing a new perspective as part of a series of lectures for the Institute of Rare and Orphan Diseases. Well, let's uh, first start with some definitions about orphan and rare diseases. Orphan disease is a rare disease with a lack of market large enough to gain support and resources for discovery and new treatments. The U.S. Rare Diseases Act in 2002 defines rare disease strictly according to prevalence, specifically, in quotes, any disease or condition that affects fewer than 200,000 people in the U.S. or about one in 1,500 individuals. Globally, there are about 300 million people who are affected. As we introduce the concept of mixed esophageal disease, as I will argue being a rare and orphan disease, we need to remind ourselves of a modern reality, which is that physicians evaluate patients focally, potentially missing the big picture as this slide exemplifies. As an example, and as it's shown on this pie chart, widely prevalent diseases may become orphan if they coexist with others. In this particular slide, I want to highlight, for example, the prevalence of gastroesophageal reflux, or GERD, as you can see, being 29%. And if you look at gastroesophageal reflux and Barrett's esophagus, that comes down to 6%. If you look at another scenario in which systemic sclerosis coexists with Barrett's esophagus, or another scenario in which systemic sclerosis is not associated with Barrett's esophagus, these percentages change. The same thing is true for an entity known as achalasia, which sometimes, rarely, can be associated with Barrett's esophagus, as you can see here in this chart. That basically changes three diseases to three different sub-diseases, if you will, that become orphans themselves. So as we see patients in everyday practice, we should consider that the data that we have on one prevalent disease may not apply to the sub-cohort, if you will, of a group of patients who have a coexisting condition that alters the dynamics of the whole picture, specifically alters outcomes and potentially um, therapeutic implications. In a simplified form, Mixed esophageal disease could be including a pre existing diagnosis, such as gastroesophageal reflux, a coexisting diagnosis, such as Barrett's esophagus, and evolving diagnosis, such as being conditions that reflect treatment for either reflux or Barrett's esophagus or the combination thereof with their own complications and their own long-term implications or whatever interventions are undertaken. So as we're going to more specifics, I would like to highlight some examples of mixed esophageal disease. For example, you may have esophageal motility disorders or EMDs. You can have esophageal gastric junction outflow obstruction disorders, including hiatal hernia. You may have different versions of gastroesophageal reflux disease, such as erosive esophagitis, non-erosive reflux disease, and functional heartburn with their own respective implications. You may have Barrett's esophagus with different stages of preneoplasia or even late cancer. You may have eosinophilic esophagitis, which is an allergy of the esophagus, or you may encounter post-interventional states such as 
state of reflux in the context of previously placed mental stent for structures of a malignant disease, um, complications or gastroesophageal reflux typically after the performance of peroral endoscopic myotomy, complications or different variations of symptoms after botulinum toxin injection at the level of the lower esophageal sphincter or even at the level of the stomach, and obviously surgical issues that may happen as a result of an intervention. We also need to keep in mind that there are pre-existing or associated gastroesophageal relations. For example, typically one sees a person with gastroesophageal reflux having gastroparesis, which is hidden under the rubric of gastroesophageal reflux and needs to be attended individually. Or we may have extraesophageal manifestations of reflux, either, either, either in the ENT sphere or manifestations from the lungs, such as asthma or chronic cough. One uh, would arguably ask the question, why consider this mixed esophageal disease state of affairs? Well, obviously it is increasingly recognized with modern testing. As we do different tests in the evaluation of disease, we start identifying sub cohorts of individual patients who have one or another abnormality found on testing. We may obviously, as I mentioned earlier, identify patients with idiopathic or systemic conditions that may be associated with a given state or post-interventional, as we mentioned after Botox, POEM, or surgery. We have overlapping, sometimes persistent or alternating symptoms which is very confusing to the assessment and management of these patients. We have definitely variable impairment of the quality of life and obviously a significant impact on both morbidity as well as mortality. There could be the pre-stage or an aftermath, as we talked about, of significant disease complications, sometimes iatrogenic. They are generally challenging to treat, typically refractory, and prone to iatrogenic errors or omissions. Any kind of surgical or endoscopic management may have a high potential for failure if it is not exercised appropriately. Finally, we may encounter differential therapeutic outcomes in response to A or B therapy be it medical or surgical, and definitely we have an inadequacy of studies because most of these patients are excluded from clinical trials. Therefore, we need to see an interaction among physicians, generalists, endoscopists, surgeons, physiologists, imaging specialists, pathologists, in order for us to account for all these variations that exist in a particular patient and provide the best approach. I want to show you an example of what I just said. For example, if you look at this trial of esomeprazole versus lansoprazole for symptom relief in patients with esophagitis, in this large study of 998 patients with erosive esophagitis, you see the usual representation by men and women, but I would like to highlight here that patients were excluded from the study that looks at outcomes of therapy in this condition if they had an esophageal motility disorder such as achalasia, scleroderma, primary esophageal spasm or other dysmotilities, esophageal stricture, duodenal ulcer, gastric ulcer, or Barrett's esophagus. So the data that we have from this particular study applies purely to the patient population with, let's say, pure erosive esophagitis. If a, if a patient presents, presents to the physician with any of the other features, we cannot really extrapolate the data presented here on this slide to that particular patient. And here's another example. If you look at uh, a number of patients who have gastroesophageal reflux symptoms, such as uh, heartburn, acid regurgitation, sometimes dysphagia, and one performs 
specific studies such as high resolution manometry and pH testing, one can find ineffective esophageal motility or IEM to be present in a significant number of individuals. And within that group, you may have people who have ineffective esophageal motility with normal pH exposure to the esophagus. That means lack of any pathologic acid exposure to the esophagus. And you may have another group more significant with abnormal esophageal pH. So again, if you start at the top with people with gastroesophageal reflux symptoms, you end up at the bottom with people who may or may not have acid reflux and who may or may not have an associated ineffective esophageal motility. In this particular study, ineffective esophageal motility or ineffective motor syndrome as it's otherwise called, uh, and also possibly in conjunction or in isolation, lower esophageal sphincter hypotonicity are themselves independent factors for formation of Barrett's esophagus in the patient cohort with reflux disease. Therefore, the outcomes can be different. The potential for malignancy in a patient with erosive esophagitis may be altered, and different measures or steps need to be undertaken. Therefore, that particular patient has a special form, if you will, of a rare or orphan disease. If you look another example of mixed esophageal disease, you may look at elements of structures such as stomach, esophagus, pharynx, airways, the lung disease. They correlate with each other. For example, you may have gastroparesis of the stomach. You may have altered anatomy of the stomach, particularly through these days with patients undergoing uh, uh, surgery for morbid obesity. You may have different characteristics on the esophageal assessment, such as sphincter hypotonicity, hiatal hernia, or even atalasia diagnosed by motility testing. You may have abnormalities in the pharynx with oropharyngeal dysphagia. That happens a lot in the elderly population that has been affected by some degree of neurologic compromise, who also may have low upper esophageal sphincter pressure thereby have lost their protective mechanisms against reflux affecting the ENT sphere or the airways. And you may also have abnormalities, again common in the elderly, of the airways with poor cough reflexes and poor cilia expression to protect against lung disease, specifically induced by acid, bile, or pepsin damage in the lung, in turn causing significant morbidity and at times mortality. So, I would like to propose consideration of at least four different components. The demographics, the clinical phenotype of the patient, any prior treatments applied to the particular patient, and also taking into consideration patient preferences. So, as we evaluate a patient with esophageal symptoms, we should very carefully examine age, sex, race, because they have differential implications for evolution of the disease. We should look for smoking and, tobacco, uh, smoking and alcohol use, obesity, the duration of the symptoms, the, the longer the symptoms, the worse the evolution, any family history that predisposes them to neoplasia of the esophagus, as well as any past medical history that would have implications in reflux or esophageal uh, manifestations from the perspective of motility. Then we also need to analyze the clinical phenotype, specifically the symptoms such as heartburn, regurgitation, difficulty swallowing, the refractoriness of any of these symptoms and to what degree they are relapsing or continuous, the presence or not of bile reflux, as well as the presence or not of nocturnal symptoms, which suggest that gravity and sleep play a significant role in the induction of the clinical symptom complex. Then as we look at prior treatments, we look at the efficacy or not of medical therapy, the prior performance of anti-reflux surgery or myotomy in certain patients. Um, other patients typically with achalasia may have undergone peroral 
endoscopic myotomy or POEM or Botox injection, which impair the functionality of the lower esophageal sphincter, predisposing to reflux. We should look at the uh, prior performance of esophageal eradication therapy in patients who have Barrett's esophagus with dysplasia, dilation in patients who have a stricture formation, and obviously any prior gastric surgery either for benign disease or for therapy of obesity. And finally, we have to also assess the role of comorbidities. If a patient has significant comorbidity from heart or lung perspective or cancer or something of that sort, that would change our overall management strategy. We also need to explore adherence to medical or surgical therapies. We have to assess the overall quality of life and its variations over time, calculate and project the life expectancy to facilitate our decision making, and also alleviate, if possible, the fear of cancer. So what kind of tools and interventions do we have available when we're faced with the management of mixed esophageal disease? First and foremost, uh, I want to show you some examples of uh, endoscopic presentations. For example, you can see uh, a patient to the left with uh, candida esophagitis. You see the white patches in the esophagus in the context of a patient who has progressive systemic sclerosis. In the middle panel, you see a meat bolus impaction above a previously present undiagnosed peptic stricture, typically in the context of uh, esophageal ring. And finally, to the right, you see an example of a person who presents with spastic esophagus that causes significant degree of impairment of esophageal clearance with dysphagia and sometimes poor clearance of any reflux acid that has occurred and stagnates in the esophagus given the poor the poor peristaltic capacity of the esophagus. In this slide, I would like to highlight the significant role of high-resolution esophageal manometry, an example of which you see here. Uh, actually, you see three examples uh, of variations of normal at the top panel, and then uh, the presentation of achalasia in its three types. Depending on the manometric appearance, of the particular patient with achalasia shown at the bottom three images, different decisions are made as far as management is concerned with uh, treatments that are surgical or endoscopic uh, depending on the manometric presentation. So that's also an important tool in our armamentarium prior to making proper and effective decision making. In this example, I wanted to highlight uh, various modalities that we have to assess gastric neuromuscular function because, as you can imagine, the performance of the esophagus, which leads into the stomach, may be affected by some kind of gastric abnormality of structure or function. For example, we have gastric scintigraphy or gastric emptying scan, which can give us information about the possibility of gastroparesis. We have electrogastrography, which is a cutaneous recording of the myoelectric activity of the stomach in the fasting as well as postprandial state. And we also have wireless motility capsule or smart pill, which allows us not only to measure gastric performance and um, retention if present, as well as small intestine, uh, mot small intestinal motility and transit, as well as colonic transit. So all of these components, if assessed properly in the right setting, can help our guide and guide us in the selection of the appropriate and most uh, uh, successful therapy. Here I wanted to show you a couple of examples of uh, interventions. In, in this case, you see uh, intervention against uh, esophageal stricture formation that can be done either with bougie dilators, as you see on the bottom left, or balloon dilation uh, in the context of a peptic stricture or even malignant stricture at times, or the performance of a stent placement, which is a 
um, the placement of the stent across the structure that could be either malignant or benign, that can be either retained forever or can be removed as necessary depending on the circumstances and the particular indication. Another approach that we use sometimes for patients with reflux and um, associated problems with gastroparesis of the so-called obstructive type in which the myelectric activity profile is normal is to assess the gastric emptying and the gastric myelectrical activity using specific equipment and then decide about managing the gastroparesis either with balloon dilation of the pylorus or injection with Botox of the pylorus to open up, if you will, the pyloric channel, facilitating gastric emptying, and thereby, in turn, minimizing retrograde reflux. Finally, a couple of points about peroral endoscopic myotomy, or POEM, for achalasia, uh, which you see on the, on the left. It's an endoscopic approach to basically cutting the muscle that crosses the uh, gastroesophageal junction. This can be done endoscopically, uh, safely, with good outcomes. And also the prospect of surgery, such as fundoplication uh, for reflux disease, as another example. And in this case, which is a surgical intervention, the surgeon has a choice based on the intelligence collected by the various studies and assessments to perform either a Nissen fundoplication, which is a complete 360 degrees, versus a toupee fundoplication, which is a 270 degree fundoplication, versus a door procedure, which is an anterior fundoplication, where a very small portion of the stomach is superimposed, almost like a cushion, extrinsically compressing against the distal esophagus, providing some degree of obstruction to retrograde flow. Depending on the intelligence collected, depending on the studies previously performed, both the endoscopist and the surgeon can decide about the proper implementation of POEM for achalasia or various forms of fundoplications for reflux, again based on collective accumulation of information that actually again highlights the orphan nature of the particular patient with a common disease but with specific sub-characteristics that are important in our decision making. Often disregarded is also the element of the natural history of a particular disease. And I would like to uh, give you some examples of that um, so you can conceptualize the whole uh, idea in decision making. In this uh, slide, you see the evolution of ineffective esophageal motility. This was a patient 59 years of age with heartburn and grade B esophagitis, which is a rose of esophagitis. And what you see, the two tracings, one obtained in November of 2015, the other one obtained in January of 2018 on the same patient. And you can see that the patient had failed contractility. You don't really see significant amount of pressurization in the esophagus. It looks quite bluish. And the patient on pH testing continued over time to have pathologic acid exposure in the esophagus because of the poor clearance of the esophagus due to the dysmotility. In this example of a 35-year-old man with acid regurgitation and a feeling of having to clear his throat all the time, you see again two tracings, similar but a bit more uh, organized, if you will, with some activity in the body of the esophagus. One is from October of 2016, the other one from May of 2018, you can see on the left that the failed contractility was about 50%, uh, with a pH less than 4 being 6.3, which is a pathologic acid exposure. As the contractility corrected itself, probably a result of ongoing therapy and time, you see that there is more activity in the body of the esophagus. You see the green, the, the green appearance of the swallowing contractions uh, along the length of the body. 
uh, with a pH that normalized and went down to 0.4%, which is quite within the normal range. So you can see that over time, over the course of two to three years, things may change. So again, these patients need to be monitored over time and assessed and reassessed with formal testing and decision making has to be accommodated to these developments. By showing you these examples, uh, I hope to relay the message that it's important to have a long-term patient-centered care. And we need to keep in mind the effects of the disease, for example, in terms of causing symptoms. For example, if you have a patient who is minimally symptomatic, may not be adherent to therapy. We need to, have to assess quality of life of these individuals and always strive in the direction of optimization or normalization of quality of life. We need to remind ourselves always of the possibility of any organ burden. And that burden could be either inflammatory in the form of, uh, let's say, peptic esophagitis with damage to the esophagus, motor in terms of compromising esophageal motility, or even neoplastic in the context of a patient with Barrett's esophagus who may develop esophageal cancer. And we also need to remind ourselves of the possible disease course scenario, such as the onset or development of complications, such as the stricture, the responsiveness to therapy, and how to judge that responsiveness, be it by symptoms, be it by endoscopic criteria, etc. And finally, also the disease extent. Otherwise, how do we know that this particular patient does not have progressive disease that now from one area of the esophagus involves either further extent upwards towards the, the hypopharynx or other organ involvement such as the lungs or the stomach. So all of these components need to be taken into consideration in the management of such patients. And this of course brings the argument for an integrated care in mixed esophageal disease you start with a patient always with symptoms that are suggestive of mixed esophageal disease. They undergo clinical, in terms of symptoms, etc., structural, in terms of endoscopy or barium swallow, as well as functional assessments such as high resolution esophageal manometry, gastric emptying, scanning, etc. And then, based on such information, undergoing medical, endoscopic, or surgical interventions upon multidisciplinary approach and overall assessment. So how do we optimize care in mixed esophageal diseases? Well, the first of all, we need to secure the diagnosis and examine any comorbidity that would be relevant in the case. We have to explain, reassure, and educate the patient so they're taking control and become participants in the long-term management of their condition. We always address diet, lifestyle, and weight control, because obviously we're dealing with the esophagus and the stomach, and that's expected to play a role there. We then need to treat to target therapy. That is, we absolutely need to make sure that when we treat, we treat aggressively enough to attack and control the main issue. For example, in this case, is a very severe esophagitis uh, on the picture uh, shown on this slide with severe ulcerations. Unless such esophagitis is healed completely, even if the symptoms are better, we should not really let that patient go. They should be completely and thoroughly evaluated on follow-up endoscopy to ensure that such degree of esophagitis has normalized. Finally, we have to be prepared to manage refractory disease. In this case, a, a picture of a fundoplication is shown. Some patients may need that in the long run. And overall, we need to somehow, again, re-examine the facts and in the long term, follow up with a patient who participates in the care and re-examine how they're doing quality of life-wise and prognosis in terms of what to expect in the future, be it benign, or malignant evolution.
And I would like to somehow highlight some trajectories of this mixed esophageal disease state. So, for example, we start off with acute disease, which uh, we are obligated, of course, to manage by inducing remission of both symptoms as well as other abnormalities that we identify, and try to induce a long-lasting remission of both symptoms, normalization of quality of life, as well as a variety of structural abnormalities that we detected up front. Then we have to also keep in mind that the, the acute disease may not respond to medical therapy and they may need to be uh, driven in the direction of surgery up front, such as cases of severe hiatal herniation, for example, that is not expected to really respond to medical therapy as we are touted and be told that um, it responds very nicely to medical therapy. These patients with severe hiatal herniation may not respond and may continue to have symptoms and probable abnormalities such as a rose of esophagitis. And finally, there are some patients who may actually have gradual decline of their state of affairs with episodes of ongoing deterioration, which is becoming harder and harder to manage and requires sometimes even revisional surgery. I would like to also say a few things about trajectories of mixed esophageal diseases. So typically we have the acute disease for which we're obligated to induce remission, hopefully effectively so, and to also try to maintain a long-lasting remission. For example, in the case of erosive esophagitis with a significant dysmotility, the use of proton pump inhibition therapy with or without any prokinetic agents. We may have cases in which the acute disease does not respond to medical therapy and there is a need for either endoscopic or surgical therapy, such as fundoplication, or we may end up see patients with progressive gradual decline of their state of affairs with episodes of ongoing deterioration or worsening reflux, resistance to medication, resistance to therapy with other means, uh, dysphagia development, who may need to have surgery if they didn't have it already, or revisional surgery if they had it before. So in summary, mixed esophageal disease is a new orphan entity that requires a multidisciplinary assessment. We have inadequate information on its natural history which appears to be largely unknown at this point. There is a significant degree of uncertainty, and we have variable potential therapeutic options, but we do not really know their efficacy in the specific elements of what we're talking about, as well as outcomes in response to such interventions. We have variable disease trajectories that are affected by multidimensional therapy as implemented accordingly, and we definitely need code or codes for epidemiologic monitoring of these conditions, which I think is an essential step before we start understanding and improving of how to manage this. Thank you very much.